Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know through our studies over the last 18 months ago uh, about COVID-19. Uh, and it's not a pretty story. Um, some of you will know I was previously the head of a, of a major clinical department in London for you know, the last 10 years. And then we came out in early 2019 to build this uh, beautiful laboratory, which is on the Fiona Stanley campus. And this lab is designed to uh, basically dig into the molecular chemistry of your body and find out new markers for disease, for diagnosis and prognosis, and also to understand the underpinning risk factors that create disease. And that was what its original mission was. Now, Roger Cook opened our lab in October 2019 and just before COVID arrived, basically. So my story is that um, the story of the laboratory is really all about COVID research in the last 18 months or so. And basically it's provided a vehicle to show what the lab can do if I want to look at it in a selfish way. So early as uh, maybe January uh, last year, I already realized that COVID was gonna be a big thing when people were dismissing it. Uh, I went off to a conference in Italy, it's the end of January, caught COVID and came, didn't, know, didn't know that, came back um, to, the, to Australia. Um, and I actually was quite ill myself uh, for uh, several weeks. And it was only later on, in fact, June, when I was actually retrospectively diagnosed as having COVID using our own laboratory instrumentation, which was then confirmed, confirmed by the serology. Um, and I've got long COVID now. So not only am I a researcher in it, I actually know what this is like. And trust me, guys, you do not want to get it. Um, right, so our lab was set up to look at gene environment interactions, things that underpin disease, and the interfaces between genes and environment. That's actually microbial bugs inside your gut, bugs on the surface of your skin. Um, the interesting thing is that those interactions create your disease risk at the individual and the population level, but they also create your, if you like, your metabolic fingerprint, your, your characteristic biochemistry of your body, which we can measure in a lot of different complex ways, and we can say something about your gene environment interactions and the likelihood of you getting a disease, and even the likelihood of a particular therapy working for you or not. So it's good for understanding populations and it's good for, the, for understanding uh, precision medicine. So that's the background. I created a network, the original Phenome Center was in London at Imperial, uh, created about 10 years ago now. And since then I've built a number of them around the world and for reasons which are very complicated, but I've ended up in Australia. So we moved the whole network center to Australia. So we've got an Australian centric map, which you like. Um, but the real idea is to try and combine the resources of all these major laboratories to look at global unmet medical needs. And here's a list of, of some of the major ones. These unmet medical needs have not gone away in the presence of COVID. In fact, some of them have got worse. In fact, there's a general rule that says anything you've got is made worse by COVID because COVID is a hyper-inflammatory disease. So we had a consensus and we decided to put COVID at the top of the list of all the things that we needed to do. This is early last year. And that means sharing resources. It means sharing knowledge. It means sharing samples. Uh, and in, now we, here in Australia, Western Australia, we have one of the best collections of COVID samples in, uh, on the planet, covering multiple ethnicities, races, et cetera, et cetera. I'll come back to that later. Um, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So if you just check any random headline, this is just a few days ago, Victoria's daily COVID-19 cases continue to drop. Right, to the minute the following day, Victoria's COVID-19 cases soar again, okay? And we're constantly placed with this mire of information and disinformation. Some of it is deliberately misinformation. Okay, which we have to cope with as well. In the modern world, it's easy to get information off the internet and it's also easy to get the wrong stuff or stuff that was perfectly sensible a couple of weeks ago and is now not, no longer sensible. So we haven't got any sensible arbitration of that. So information, disinformation. I'm gonna give you some facts about COVID today. Some of you will probably know a lot of these things anyway because almost everybody on the planet has become an expert on COVID in the last year. Right, we'll all become virologists, but there'll be a few things hopefully that you will, will be new to you. So if we just take a few facts, it's a systemic disease, uh, not just a respiratory disease, it, it's, its main manifestation is a respiratory disease. It's a beta coronavirus, very like SARS-1. In fact, 
SARS, the original SARS, was SARS-CoV-1. Now, that affected exactly 898 people in the world in recorded cases. But what's interesting is of those people that survived, about 50% of them had long SARS, which lasted 10 to 15 years, and that it's still counting. So it, because the, the genetics behind the virus is very similar to the original SARS, we can expect that it's, its actual effects of the virus to be similar, and it does look as though that is the case. Unmitigated, that means without doing anything to stop it, uh, COVID is about 60 times as deadly as influenza. So when we say, say it's just like flu, it's just not like flu. And more importantly, flu, except in ex very extreme situations, does not cause massive systemic problems, right? So as we will see in a moment, um, COVID can cause multiple systemic problems in multiple organ systems. The incubation time, uh, there's a lot of variation in this. Earlier on, uh, we were thinking in the range of two to 12 days. The later variants have got better, right, at, uh, at uh, dividing, if you like, or being replicated, and they're shorter, right? Um, the onset of the first sy symptoms to severe disease takes about eight to 10 days. What I mean is, when you get your, your, your cough, your sniffle, or whatever the hell it is to start with, and you're starting to feel rough, eight to 10 days later, you're either gonna get better or you're gonna get seriously worse. And seriously worse means potentially ending up on a, on, a, uh, on a ventilator. The thing that we've discovered recently is, even on your first day, your future is determined. So when the first time you get symptoms, it's already in your biology that will determine whether you're going to get seriously ill or not. I'll come back to that in a moment. The new variants are a worry, um, and we'll come back to vaccination as well in a moment. They're much more infectious, um, and there's an, as you may have heard, there's also a Delta plus AY 4.2 variant that is out now, which is now currently driving the expansion of COVID in the United Kingdom, even in vaccinated people. Uh, it's very much more than just a lung disease. It's complex multi-system failure, and it affects children and adults, the older you are, the worse the symptoms tend to be, but children can get it and they can get long COVID as well. And of course, if the children get long COVID, they've got it for a very long time, the whole of the rest of, of their life. Anything that you've got, COVID makes it worse. If you've got arthritis, if you've got gout, all right, if you've got respiratory disease, if you've got diabetes, it adds a load to that, to that burden. Um, and recovery, it's complicated you can actually get worse as you're recovering with respect to some of the systemic effects. So when you, it's not over when you stop coughing because your system is still highly perturbed. And we have evidence that some systems are still perturbed at least a year after the original uh, um, uh, onset of the disease. And the variation in that is huge as well. So it depends on the estimates and what questions you ask of people and what you care to look at. But the estimate is between about 5% and maybe 100%, or certainly 90-something 90, 90 percent, of the people who get COVID who go on to get long COVID. So how can it be so variable? It depends on what questions and how you, how you assess it. But even the most conservative estimate would make, probably means there's 25 million people with long COVID in the world now, the most conservative estimate. What does it look like as a disease? It's a, 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 uh, in the early stages, it's been classified as a respiratory disease, of course, but it's the stuff on the right-hand side you've probably got to really worry about. Now, COVID can affect blood vessels. It affects epithelial cells, which line surfaces, the lung, of course, but blood vessels too. And because it damages those structures, it can cause microembolisms, so blood clots all over the body. And that means almost any organ system can be involved. But also the virus can attack multiple organ systems. It can attack pancreatic beta cells, for instance, and cause, cause diabetes. So there's almost anything that you've got, it can be affected. So there's GI symptoms, there's dyserythropoiesis, failure to produce red blood cells, porphyria due to red blood cell enhanced breakdown, liver failure, diabetes, type one in children has been recorded. That's something you've got for life. Type two in adults, a range of different neurological problems potentially very serious long-term cardiovascular risk problems as well. So this is very serious. So when you're recovering, what is it you've recovered from? It's not just the cough, it's all the system that we're trying to examine. What determines severity? There's a, 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 quite a lot of interest in this. And we've done some work with Cambridge University, they're part of our, part of our network. 
where we looked at the immunology in great detail in people of different severities and, and just long, uh, in longitudinal studies. And basically what happens is early in the disease, as soon as the virus starts to get in and replicating, the cell that's been damaged sends out messages, chemokines and cytokines, and they basically say, help, I'm being attacked by a virus. And there are cells in the body, including great named CD8 T cytotoxic killer cells, uh, which are hanging around just waiting for these messages. And when they get the message, they follow the chemical gradient and they destroy that cell. And those people don't go on to get severe respiratory damage. And that is determined very, very early, whether or not your CD8s respond quickly. It's interesting because the CD8 response and kill, that kills the, the, the virus and the cells that's, that, where it's replicating, that triggers a series of other events which might actually in, impact on the development of long COVID. So it's, it's a sort of two-edged sword there. The people that don't have the CD8 killer cell response, they get worse and worse, right? And the lung tissue gets more deeply infected. It goes from your nose down into your lung. And then eventually there's so much cytokine and all the cells going, I'm dying, help me. There's a cytokine storm, as we call it. And then you get a huge immunological response, which causes more damage than it actually, uh, actually cures. And that's where you get the lung scarring and some of the long-term respiratory effects. So there's two types of cytokine and cellular interaction. One which is sort of good, but still gives some long-term risk. Another one which is entirely uh, deleterious. Let's look at the numbers. This is today's statistics, 252 million, 5 million dead, according to official statistics. In Australia, we've been blessedly lightly touched so far, but you can see the third wave that we have is actually much bigger uh, than the previous waves. But you'll notice also the, the death rate is actually lower, right? It, this is, I'll show you in a moment with the UK statistics where it's more apparent. Part of that is because although Australia was a bit tardy in getting vaccinated, most of the people that have vaccinations have them relatively recently, which means the, the, the antibody activity is quite high. And as a result of that, we've had fewer mortalities. The other thing is because Australia could watch back and look at the rest of the world you know, in trouble, we've actually been able to look at some of the best medical practices from around the world. And so we've been actually better at dealing with it than many other countries. But if you look at the UK statistics as total, case, uh, total new daily cases, 42,000 today, Okay, this is in a, a, a country where there's 86% double vaccination of adults. Right? Um, you notice in the first wave, there was a lot of deaths. In the second wave, there's a lot of deaths. In the third wave, not so many deaths. And that's because we've got better at it, but also because we've actually got a, a lot of vaccinated people. And the vaccination really stops you getting severe disease. Right? It doesn't completely it can completely stop it, but it will massively reduce it. In fact, your chances of, of dying are 10 times greater if you haven't been vaccinated than if you have been vaccinated. So even though the vaccines are, are getting less effective through time, I'll come back to that in a moment, um, it's still massively better to be vaccinated than not to be. Um, so that doesn't, only, that doesn't cover everything. Now, as we have COVID patients in the, in the hospitals, obviously critical care patients can't, who are in the background anyhow, people with cardiac disease, whatever it is, can't get into the critical care because the COVID patients are there. So we have an excess mortality rate, which is very significant. And it's about th between three and four times greater than the COVID deaths. So if you look at the official record of deaths of 5 million, in fact, 17.4 million is the expe expected uh, uh, or the measured excess deaths. Now, that doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but it is a lot. Total military casualties of the Second World War is 25 million, and that was over five years, and this, this 17.4 million is over one and a half years. And if you look at all the civilian casualties, about 70 million people in total, that's 14 million people a year in the Second World War. That is going on now. That is what the cost of, of COVID is to our society. And it's not going to stop soon. It is still accelerating, long COVID is increasing. People have got long-term uh, effects. And in the UK, there are now elective surgery for some things, orthopedics. The waiting list is now five and a half years. Okay, the longest it's ever been in the history of the NHS. So when you factor all these things in, this is pretty serious what we're dealing with at the moment. Vaccinations, okay. We've had a lot of vaccinations. 51% of the, uh, the world's population has had at least one dose. That's 7. 
Three, six billion doses have been given. So don't let anybody tell you this is not being tested well. It is actually tested quite well in, in real time. The other thing is that these vaccines, although they're new, they're remarkably safe in comparison with a lot of other vaccines. I, when, 18 months, I was thinking, well, it's going to take ages to get vaccines and we're not going to know about its safety. But in fact, de facto, um, it's actually a lot better than we thought. And that's because modern technology for developing vaccines is so much better than it used to be. The downside of all of this is only 4.4% of the poor people in the world and in the, th in, in the developing countries have been vaccinated. And of course, that's terrible for them, but they also, that creates a reservoir of future uh, disease and also variation in the, uh, uh, the, the, the viral genomes. Um, also, as you, the, the virus evolves, it changes its chemistry, it changes its structure, it changes its infectivity. Um, this is some work, again, linked to our, our studies with Cambridge. Um, B117 is the Alpha or Kent variant, the British one, if you like. Um, that, this is work that shows that the uh, mRNA vaccines are not quite so effective with that variant. And in fact, they're, not so, they're even less effective uh, with the, um, the Delta variant and the, potentially the new Delta Plus variant as well. So we've got to think about this thing as, as being evolving and we need to have agile strategies for dealing with the evolution of this. And of course, we need to be vaccinating more and we need to adapt our vaccines to be able to cope with the new uh, genetic variation. This shows it very clearly. This is some work from uh, the so-called the Zoe Group, which is at King's College London, where they're following uh, the reports of about three quarters of a million people on a daily basis who are typing in into an app about what is going on, about uh, um, uh, you know, their own experiences, but it's also monitoring a lot of the statistics about the vaccinology. And so once you've double vaccinated, it starts to lose efficacy, and it's probably about 3% a month. Uh, so after six months, the, the Pfizer uh, effectiveness of protecting you against severe disease drops down to 74%. With AZ, it's um, 67, 65, something like that. So when you've got 100% double vaccination, in time, you're going to lose that protectiveness. So that means that boosters are going to be required in the future. And possibly, just like influenza, this is one of the few similarities to, in, really to influenza, is we may need new ones every year for eternity in order to deal with it. Um, again, other stuff. This is now some information from Imperial College London published about two weeks ago on the Delta variant. And the important thing here is that although the vaccines remain still effective, they are losing effectivity and they are not effective at controlling the population levels if people behave badly. So all the so-called freedoms that we're hearing about in the East are actually potentially sort of lunacy because we're not at the situation yet that we can give people freedom. We haven't even seen the peak of this in, in Australia yet. And so continue, down, downstream, the vaccines only work if they're coupled with so changes in social behaviour. So we'll probably never really be able to go back the way things were before, and we should probably still be using masks uh, and taking all those, those precautions. And of course, how to enforce that, how to convince people that that's important is gonna be uh, uh, really a massive task. And there's an Australia, this was published just a few days ago, uh, which is looking at long COVID. So um, there's people who are critically ill on intensive care, they get a lot of problems. But in fact, if, as you probably know, is if you're on intensive care, you tend to have problems anyway. And the question is really, is COVID any different to that? And the answer is yes, you probably get higher levels of long-term problems with people who've been on critical care with COVID. And in particular, you get all this lung scarring, so you get a lot of long-term respiratory uh, problems. Uh, sorry, this is a bit complicated. If you go to people who've been less affected, mildly affected, you still get long COVID. But long COVID has what we say a different phenotype, has different combinations of symptoms. And by far the commonest is chronic fatigue. All right, so chronic fatigue is really present in a lot of people. It's also a very important early symptom as well. And some of these symptoms are also things that are common in older people. So again, this is affects how you interpret the statistics. If you're surveying people and you say, you know, have you got any joint pain? And anybody over the age of 60 go, yeah, I have a bit, you know? But that doesn't mean to say it's, it was long COVID induced. It might be because they've got that anyway. So to picking out the wheat from the chaff in, in, uh, in survey information is, is actually quite complicated, which is also why you get variation in the, the reports that you see uh, in the newspaper. 
but fatigue is a really important one. The other thing that's really different is, is anosmia and parosmia, a change in the sense of smell. That's something that isn't common in any other intensive care situations or indeed as a side effect of other diseases. And that is to do with the neurochemistry that's changed by COVID. I'll come back to that in a minute. So we have this post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, that's the posh name, for long COVID, and that can affect every organ system in the body as well. Anything can be affected in the first part of disease, can be affected later, and that could be persistence of something that was earlier, or it could be something that develops after the uh, onset of the original disease. Uh, this is Andrew Miller, I think many of you will know, who is uh, uh, formerly the president of the uh, WAAMA, and he's worried about what happens to children because although children tend to be relatively asymptomatic, um, you can have a situation with something called multiple inflammatory syndrome in children, or Miss C, where the children are infected, they seem to be fine for about eight to 10 weeks, and then they get a very serious multiple inflammatory problem, which can be uh, certainly can be life threatening. But we've, uh, our, this is not published yet, but our work with Harvard medical school paediatrics department shows that the biochemical abnormalities in children are exactly the same as you get in adults. So the stuff under the bonnet is still wrong, okay, even if they're not showing any serious lung symptoms. So that is profoundly worrying and that's not published yet, it will be soon, uh, but that changes our view on, on the importance potentially of getting children vaccinated early. What are we doing about it? Um, well, we've got a, a, a response that's led out of uh, WA, bringing some of these great universities together. We've got a big collection of samples now. Uh, we've got a COVID-19 import license, believe it or not. Right? So we kind of keep it out, but we're shipping it in. Of course, we bring it in under very controlled conditions to work in, a, in a, an appropriate laboratory. Uh, but we've got something like 10,000 samples now in our lab from around the world, covering all sorts of studies. Uh, some of which are really interesting and important. I was actually so pleased to receive the Harvard Pediatric samples. I took a post photograph of the box, but they, they arrived there. Um, and the, this is how we study it, right? We've got, we're trying to map the disease course from the normal population through the disease and hopefully back again. And we are in a, a good position here in Western Australia. We've got some really good epidemiological studies, Bustleton study, RAIN study, you know, him study, origin study, all those things. And we've actually been running these in the background. So we're getting a, a very good idea of what normal Australian biochemistry looks like. Because when you are recovered from COVID or any other disease, you need to be back in that space which maps onto your, where you should be in, for your age and gender within your background environment. That is your real metric of recovery. And so we are looking at those samples. We're also looking at the samples that are fed in from our various sources with all the same analytical technology. So the data are totally interoperable. And this is also unique in the world that we actually have multiple analytical tools, all of which, which create the same sort of information on a huge diversity of samples, an immensely powerful situation. Uh, there's some of our people in the PC2 lab gowned up looking at uh, uh, looking at some samples. And as I said, the bottom right is it, we have a complex of instrumentation which generates different windows that you can look at the biochemistry and abnormalities of the disease. The big questions you're asking is detection and prediction, uh, severity and mechanisms, and also monitoring uh, long COVID. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but we're looking at the whole natural history and, and ev evolution of the disease. Uh, we're trying, we've got some patents that we've filed and we're trying to bring these, some of these te new tests up to regulatory standards, working with one of our partners. Um, early prediction is probably intractable in terms of severity of disease, not because there aren't markers that indicate you can get severe, because of the time it actually takes for you to go from being mild to severe. So you can have somebody who goes into a hospital uh, do it with relatively mild symptoms, they're diagnosed, and four hours later they can be on intensive care. There's no test you can do that will actually be able to predict that. So a lot of the changes that are going to determine your future happen quite early in the uh, evolution of the disease. We put all our technologies together. We've written a lot of papers on this. This is one of our first papers where we look multiple technologies and we were able to show really conclusively that this is a multi-system disease. This is one of the first papers in the, in the field to actually show this, this depth of change by chemistry. I'll give you just one example of one of the machines, if you like, or one of the windows that we can open to have a look at, which is an interesting one. So if you look at amino acid metabolism, we all know about amino acids, important in nutrition, build protein, et cetera, et cetera. But amino acids are actually important 
had lots of uh, other intermediary metabolic functions. And you get huge changes in amino acid metabolism caused by COVID. And in particular, some go up and some go down. And the ones on the right-hand side are quite interesting. These are some, this is part of the tryptophan pathway. And there are things like uh, quinolinic acid, massively elevated in COVID. Quinolinic acid is used in laboratories as an experimental striatal neurotoxin to generate Parkinson's disease in rats. And this goes up. Okay. There's also uh, hydroxykinurinine and, 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 and as well as quinolate, which go up. Um, and this is present in Huntington's disease. And then there's neoptrin, which is actually a marker of ex acute uh, in inflammatory and cellular activity. If you put that all together, you start looking at the pathway. Um, this is a tryptophan pathway. The bl blue means it's gone down, and red means it's gone up in that pathway. And this first step for the, uh, the, for the first transformation of tryptophan is actually, called, is actually stimulated by indole dioxygenases, which is stimulated in turn by the cytokines that are released when the cells go in to kill the virus and the cells containing the virus. And that set triggers off a whole series of events in this pathway. If you look on the right-hand side, these, this pathway is associated with a whole range of other bad things. HIV, dementia, Tourette's syndrome, tick disorders, etc., etc. Okay, So we are causing major perturbation in the pathway, which is already known to be deeply involved uh, with a range of, of unpleasant diseases. One of the ones really interesting is the biochemistry of COVID is really similar to systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune systemic disease, causes has multi-organ envelopment, causes liver damage, kidney damage, skin lesions, of course, and interestingly, um, extreme long-term fatigue. How do you measure whether people have recovered or not? Well, you use all the biochemical windows to say, if you've gone over there, have you come back to where you should be? So we published the first paper on this a few months ago, and we show that basically people, when they get the disease, they have a divergent pathway to lead a whole of different series of subphenotypes. So not only of severity, but also the different background diseases they have. And then when they're recovering, new things emerge, new problems emerge and not all of them get back to normal. Now we're now looking at samples from people who have had the disease a year ago, and for some biochemical parameters, there is no recovery, right? And these are parameters, quite interesting, they want to relate to mitochondrial metabolism and energy metabolism. Of course, fatigue is somewhat related to that as well. If you look at some, some WA people, we only have a relatively small number of WA samples. We've got a lot more of our information has come from other studies. Uh, but if you look at people at six months after the had COVID but not been hospitalized, 57% of them have still got between one and nine symptoms. And that's the distribution there. Chronic fatigue being one of the most common. And mildly effective people tend, in their initial acute phase tend to have uh, um, uh, long fatigue effects. Uh, also as interesting as joint pain, it's, it's as common in so-called recover people as it is in the acute phase of the disease. And that is another inflammatory uh, persistent complication. Some pretty complicated looking stuff. You'll be pleased now I'm getting towards the end of it now. This is how we try to visualize this. So if we take one of the machines that measure amino acids, we can look at what normal people look like versus recovered people. And if you look on the top left there, the green dots are from normal people and the blue are from people six months after they're supposed to have recovered. And you can see the distribution for these metabolites is not the same. Some people have recovered, they've gone back into the green zone, but other people aren't. And if you look at the same samples, the same people from a different machine, a different window, you get a different pattern. There's more recovery with respect to lipoproteins than there is with amino acids. And a lot of these parameters that are changed, that in, uh, are still abnormal in the uh, so-called recovered people or the people that some months after COVID are actually exactly the same as they had when they were uh, in the acute phase of the disease. One of the ones that's most worrying and is something that we're concerned particularly concerned about is cardiovascular disease. And I just, this, I've tried to, this is a very simple version of what the, what, what the way it really is. If you look on this little graph, on the left-hand side is a, as a normal WA control people. The red is acute phase, right? And the blue, the little blue one is recovery. And this is for the apolipoprotein B100, A1 ratio. That is the best marker for cardiovascular risk and atherosclerotic risk there is. And you can see that the healthy WA people, when they're in the, in the disease, they jump up into medium risk or even high risk. And 
if you look at the, the, the blue on the, uh, on the left-hand side, the bigger one that's got more variance, that's the Cambridge people, where it had a bigger range of severity. And what we find is that the Cambridge and the follow-up position, right, their mean position for this marker, is actually still in the medium risk category. So COVID shifts your cardiovascular risk acutely during the acute phase of the disease, and then it slowly recovers, but doesn't recover completely in many patients. So if you think about that and all the millions of people that have had this, there is a potential that there has been a systemic change in cardiovascular risk for those millions of people, which will have massive long-term effects and their risk of having heart disease and myocardial infarction, uh, but also have a massive cost to the state, the country, etc. So that's not good news. And we need to be able to monitor these parameters so that we can work it out at a population level, what are we gonna need in the future? But also at the individual level, you say, you know, you have got these parameters still abnormal and we need to mitigate those by the following drugs, the following treatments, etc. So there is a, a population angle on this and there's also an individual angle on this as well. And in fact, some of the people a year on actually in Cambridge's case, uh, have, uh, have still got ratios that are uh, sort of like uh, giving them a, a, a myocardial infarction risk of between two and tenfold greater than the general population or before they actually had that problem. So if we want to summarize it in one massive diagram, what we're trying to do, right, um, we go from a healthy space, no, we're normal space, right, is normal actually in Western society for... Um, for normal to be unhealthy, right? So if you, are, if you are looking at what is normal, it encourages people, covers people with diabetes, pre-diabetes, cardiovascular problems, et cetera, right? And there's a relatively small number, probably only about 10% of people are really genuinely healthy. They don't have all, any of these negative things. The more unhealthy you are, the more likely you are to move into the new space, into the severity space, and that's the top right-hand side of this diagram. It's the COVID space. And that exacerbates things that you've already get pushes pre-diabetes into diabetes, et cetera. And then as you recover, you don't just go straight back. You go through a new space, which is at the bottom, which are the different risk spaces, which may also have um, uh, symptoms associated with them as well. And then slowly over a period potentially of many years and potentially never, people eventually get back into that, let's call it normal space of biochemistry. And that's what we're trying to study here. And only when we've completed doing that will we really know long-term what we have to do with COVID. And of course, we're hoping to deliver lots of uh, actionable solutions on the way, but this is, we're in this not only as a population and as a planet, in this for a long haul. Scientifically, it's a long haul to sort that out as well. So on that happy note, um, I'll just thank the people that to give us money and people who look after us. Uh, and uh, thank you for kindly listening. I'll be happy to take any questions.